presentation that I want to give you that I really I want you to be engaged. So there'll be times where you'll talk at your table and share some ideas and then maybe share some ideas with me on the stage. And uh, I plan to leave you with a lot of tools so that after this day, you have some uh, help in getting some of this work started. We'll talk a little bit about the challenging times in Nepal. We'll also talk about how HR can help through these times. I'll talk to you a little bit about managing uh, industrial professional leadership talent, primarily focused on the leadership side of things. And uh, we'll have some time to talk at the tables. But what I want to focus on today is really talking about some fundamentals. You can even call them pillars to the uh, HR talent management. And number one is performance. Think of this as performance management, performance in the organization. Two, potential, which is not as easy as some people think it is. Three, readiness. Readiness in terms of how ready are your people to move up to higher leadership positions. And finally, fit within the organization, within the role. And we're going to emphasize development. Now, in my little bit of research about Nepal, and you guys experience this every day at work as HR leaders, I know these are challenging times. As I was preparing for the conference and looking at the theme of Roadmap for Challenging Times, I made particular emphasis to give you some tools that will help you work through the challenges of performance management, potential estimation, looking at readiness and succession planning, and finally looking at fit and development. So I do plan to give you a bit of a roadmap, how to get through, some tools to use. Take them if you like, if you think they'll be useful, or help them blend into what you're already doing. But in the, in the area, I know we read of high unemployment. But more significant problem is perhaps the underemployment, meaning that someone who's well-educated, has good experience, but can't seem to find a job that fits their skills. They're working for less money and, and less of a role than they could be capable of doing. You have highly educated workers going up road. I heard that up road means like England, US, and Canada, and different places like that. You also have skilled labor going to places like Saudi Arabia, where I work, or going to Malaysia, or going to other countries, India, uh, Qatar, different places like that. We know that the development after secondary school and university, getting started in the workforce is lacking in some ways, but there's work on that through organizations such as Growth Sellers. And with the slower economic growth means salaries somewhat become stagnant, which then can cause people to want to go up road. But to start off, let's go ahead and start talking to each other. At your table, if you would share with one another, what is your number one talent challenge in your organization? When you think about people talent, you know, people who drive your organization success, what is your number one challenge with them? If you just take a, two minutes to talk at your table, three minutes to share at your table, what you think is your number one problem with talent in your organization? You're going to sit together a long time today, so just start talking to each other. <laughs>
Okay, take about two more minutes. I know you might have four or five big cha talent challenges, but just share your top one. Okay, we we'll take one more minute, and I'm going to ask for three tables. Whoever wants to, three tables can share some of the challenges discussed at your table. So we'll have some people with a microphone, and uh, if you know, just to so get ready. Maybe you want to be one of those people who shares what your tables talked about, your top one or two areas. Okay. Let's go ahead and have the first table volunteer. Which table would like to share the top topic or two that came up in terms of an HR talent challenge? Just raise your hand and we'll have a microphone here. Okay, we have one person over here. All right, who will be the second table? We have one down here. And then get, let's get the three people. Okay, second table is right here in the front. Third table is right there. All right, we got our three tables. All right, we got the gentleman back here. We got someone up here and then over here. Uh, right here, onto your left. Over here, uh, that, that person, yeah. And then the table over here. I think the table over here was the person. I'll pass it on. Okay, I'll pass it on. And then right back there. There's a gentleman right back here. If you can get a mic to that gentleman in the back. Okay, we'll get to you as you get a microphone, but let's start up here in the front. Would you like to share first, uh, what is one or two challenges from your, what's one or two challenges that you guys talked about at your table? So the number one challenge that we are facing is uh, highly educated workers going abroad. Okay. So we being a noble bank, we are facing the challenge of uh, retaining the employees. We are directly competing with the countries like Canada, US, and Europe because every uh, skill lever, every skilled worker is traveling to abroad for better opportunities. So that was our discussion. Great, thank you. And this is going to be a key challenge. And one of the things I'm going to talk about today is how to engage your best talents where they feel like, if I leave my job with this company, I might not be getting as good a development, as good an experience, as good a challenge, and as good an opportunity as if I stay here. That's one thing we're going to talk about. Thank you so much. OK, let's go to this table. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Yes, I would like to go for a second. Similar to what she has said, but apart from that, what we discuss here is uh, the challenge that we are currently facing in our organization is handling Gen Z, millennials, and alpha, because the mindset, the expectations they have is quite different from the organizations for the last you know, 40 years who has okay. been operating here. There is a difference. There is a gap. So we are Tell experiencing... Two, two of those differences, two of the big differences, what would they be? One is the mindset, the perception, the Gen Z, millennials, uh -huh. the newcomers have, and the organizations they are adopting. And another one is the, uh, the economic crisis that we are yes. having right now. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. This table? Yeah, very good input. Hello. Uh, this team, uh, we focused on a couple of things. Number one is there are people who are qualified academically, mm -hmm. sound academic results, mm -hmm. but a huge gap in professional work. Okay. There is a gap. They don't know how to work in that particular institution or something like that. Okay, so the experience they, they, they lack. Experience, they lack the experience. Yeah, and that's going to be a key. We're going to yes. talk a lot about that, actually. Thank you. And the other one is uh, them not having professional ethics in an institution. Ooh, okay, that's an important thing. Could you give an example of the professional ethics that might be lacking? Yes, uh, when you work in an institution, mm -hmm. you know, you first and foremost, you come for a year, suppose. Mm -hmm. You have a contract for a year. Uh-oh. 
but simultaneously you're not dedicated because you're also looking for other opportunities outside of it. Okay. At the moment you get that, you're ready to compromise here. And they do not understand that how much effort that company is putting towards that in individual and looking for the establishment of that particular okay. post. The other is, again, mm -hmm. cultural differences, right? Mm -hmm. Being honest. Yep. Uh, these are some of the things that comes under ethics. Major, major issues. And uh, one about lack of commitment to a company exactly. is worldwide right now, especially it's among young professional talent. Exactly. That's, thank That's you, sir. Right. Thank you so much. And we have the last one back at this table, and then we'll, we'll move on. These are great insights and, and, and significant challenges, and many of them will be addressed here. Yes, sir, in the back. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to HR Meet, and welcome to the Salty Kathmandu. My name is Rupesh Shrestha, and I represent the Salty Kathmandu. All right. <laughs> That's why I welcome you all. Right, so aligning to all my colleagues what we have said, the four points that we have collected from the team. Number one is the culture. Mm. Culture issues, retention issues, and I've copied from you the salary stagnant. The yes. big, big issues here. Yes. And the skill set. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause for everyone who shared. These are, these are very good real world insights. Not unlike other places in the world facing some of the similar challenges, but I think yours, uh, particularly the connection between, it's not just finding a different job in Kathmandu, it could be going away from the country and maybe not coming back for a long time. So you also have a brain drain a little bit and some of the top skills. Uh, and it's hard to bring it back in the country, perhaps, if they're starting to get paid Western salaries with the Western lifestyle. So these are great challenges. Now, when you think about challenges and journeys and roadmaps, I couldn't help but think about the Himalayas. I do not want to go on some of these trips. <laughs> um, I was looking at some of these roads, and maybe some of you in here have been on some of these roads, but I'm just amazed how much courage it must take to, for instance, be on that bus in the bottom picture. I think I would walk back down the road if I was on that bus. Um, and, and, and the journeys in a roadmap means that even if you have a roadmap, doesn't mean it will be an easy journey. You agree? Having a roadmap might tell you a little bit about what to expect, where you're going, how you might get there, but it's going to be a hard journey. And the things I talk about today, if you implement them, won't be easy to implement. It'll take some training, it'll take some thought, it'll take some commitment, it'll take some working within your culture, but it can give you lots of value. Now, what I want to talk about essentially are these, four, these five things right here, these, these four, excuse me, um, measuring performance and also managing performance, fit considering the fit that someone is, has in the organization, we're going to talk about potential for different levels. And you estimate potential. Don't have someone tell you that you're going to assess potential. And I tell you that because I can tell you quite honestly, after many years of looking at this, assessing it is hard to do. It really, really is. And you can't say that someone's assessment at 25 years old and the potential you saw with that person at 25 is the same potential they have at 30. Just five years can make a difference. And then uh, assessing readiness, which you can assess actually very well. But for potential, you estimate it. In fact, I worked at Shell, um, you know, Royal Dutch Shell, and we used to call, um, you know, very carefully, it's an estimate of potential. We use a process, capacity, achievement, results, and I'll share something similar to that, but it's an estimate. Now, take, please take time to read this statement. Now, people in Nepal do have challenges. There's not going to be a lot of comfort. As you lose people in your organization and you have to backfill, and you have to build the talent, and you have to maintain people, retain them, you have to find the opportunities to get them excited, you will be having challenges in HR group. 
But helping people grow, young people grow, is a lot about giving them the challenges and helping them feel like I am becoming someone stronger and better here. And I think without having to worry about the salary picture and the stagnant salaries, that a strong development focus will help you retain and develop some of your best leaders and perhaps keep them. Can't promise you that because you can also develop people and they'll leave. And I had that in my career. I had people on my teams who I invested in and it only took about eight months where they grew a lot and they found different jobs. But you know what? I helped that person reach her potential and grow. And it made other people excited and it opened up opportunities for more people. Now, as we talk about the first one, managing uh, and measuring performance, Here's a statement by a man named Peter Drucker. Anyone remember the name Peter Drucker? You heard a lot in the 1980s. Father of management, wrote a lot about management. You haven't heard about this person maybe in the last 10 years, but he had this statement. If you are a good manager, then you will deliver performance for the company. And if you're a good manager of people, You'll deliver performance in your people. And it is the ultimate test. It's not today often about are they happy, but are they performing? That's the ultimate test of management. Can you take the complexity, the challenges, the lack of resources, the uh, changing demands in the organization, the customer demands, the competition, and still deliver performance for your company? Can you deliver growth? Can you meet your goals? Can you work within your budget? Can you even meet the goals with limited budgets? That's an ultimate test of a good manager. Whether you're an HR manager, an operations manager, a sales manager, or anyone, can you deliver performance? So let's talk about it. Now, we know what high performance looks like. You can think in your organization and say, okay, high performance is they've, they've exceeded the goals. People like them. Uh, they, they get the best out of other people. They're able to work within the demands of the job and not complain. They're, they're people who others go to for help. I mean, I, I, you don't need me to tell you today what a high performance looks like. We all know what they look like. And, and it might look a little different in certain organizations, a service-oriented one versus a production uh, manufacturing plant versus a, you know, a consulting business versus a government business. But what I want to talk to you about soon will be about performance failure. Now, rating people is harder than seeing what performance looks like. Sometimes we put in a force distribution, and it's hard to get input. How are you measuring it? There's biases to rating and force rating. How many of you in your company have a force distribution of ratings? What I mean by that is you maybe have a five scale of ratings, but your fit, you know, number, top rating only 10% can get. Or in your second rating, maybe only 30% can get. Then only 40%. Then last, bottom one, 10%. How many of you have a forced distribution? Raise your hand. Okay. Not, not that many. This is prevalent in the West. Forced distributions are. They present challenges. Um, we'll talk in, in Microsoft, I like the way we had two ratings every year. I was rated on my commitment. That is, how well did I meet my commitments, my goals, my initiatives that I was working on? And how strong was my contribution to the success of the company? Meaning that maybe I met my commitments, but did I work on important stuff and did it make an impact in the company? Sometimes you didn't meet all your commitments, but what you did meet really had a high contribution and vice versa. Sometimes you, you did all you're supposed to do, but it didn't have the impact that was expected. We were given stock rewards based on contribution. And we got our merit increases based on the commitments. I like that separation. Now, we're going to talk about strategy trees for alignment. And in visual factory management, this is the term that in factories you see it often, but we can use it in a workplace. If I went into your workplace, is there any indicator how your company is performing that's on the walls as visual for people to see? Do you have any charts listed? Do you have any you know, note of your goal attainment? Do you have anything that I can walk in your office area and see about the performance of your company? Raise your hand if you have something that people can see if they walk in. Not many people do. But I can tell you that when people can visualize the goals and see the progress to it, it might help. You see this in factories a lot, but it's not done enough. Now, you know, uh, with, with so few people doing force distribution, I won't say much about 
What is your rating impact? Because when you have a force distribution, but your ratings impact a lot of areas, like promotion, merit, bonus, status, you can have problems because you've already divided up your workforce artificially. But behind all this, I want to tell you what's most important about performance management. Simply, feedback. It's not the rating. It's not really even as much as you can say the goal attainment. But do your employees have feedback on their performance such that they feel like I was recognized? People noted the hard work that I did? I, can, I know that my boss understands what I put into this work, and I know how I can do better, or I know how I did well. Are you giving them any feedback? Even appreciation feedback. Thank you so much for working hard this year doing this. Thank you so much for working hard this week. Don't wait till the end of the year. <laughs> you know? A thank you is feedback. It's recognition. That's what's important about performance. Most important. So I want to give you an example, though, of something that I call strategy trees. This is an old concept. It's been around for a while. I used to work with it 25 years ago. And I've seen it important. So I just want to talk a little bit about it. And you'll get a copy of this template, so if you want to use it. But the idea that can people within your organization understand how they connect to the goals and the vision and what they're doing in the organization? This is one way to look at accountability. But there's other ways you can do strategy trees where it's mostly talking about your commitments and your initiatives and the metrics. I'm always surprised how many organizations don't have a clear picture with their employees of what they're working on and how things align up. If I was to talk at your company and speak with a few employees and say, what's the vision of the company? Where do you expect to be in five, 10 years? What are you striving for? Would they know? If I was to say, what company-wide goal or what, what major goals are you working on with the, for the company? I'm not talking about what's your initiatives or I'm not talking about what task you're doing today or what you accomplished this month. I mean, what does it feed into? What goal of the company does it feed into? How are you helping the company succeed? Will they be able to answer that question? One of the things about performance, if you want to really drive it, is to help people feel a purpose, an attachment, a connection to what they're working on. How does it matter beyond me? This is a visualization in some ways. How can I see where I make a difference in this company? And if people feel like they're important to the company and they know which goal they align to and they know how they're helping drive the vision, that right there gives them a greater sense of purpose than many companies will give them. Just want to share with you two examples. This one was in Kraft Foods uh, 12 years ago, working with the continual improvement department. They thought it through. And they had a lot of work they're doing, but they saw exactly what they were trying to deliver. And they knew which employees were working on which initiatives and why they're working on it and how it's measured. I helped out the American Red Cross uh, 20 years ago, and I did this strategy tree for them for disaster services within American Red Cross. And again, it gave them a sense of purpose. It clarified to them all that they were doing. The, the thing I remember the most about uh, talking to the person who's leading disaster services for this Red Cross chapter in San Jose, California, was that, man, I'm doing more than I thought I was. <laughs> that her group was doing a lot of work. And so then your question becomes, what's important? What's really the most important work you're doing? Can some of these things go off your, your list? At least for this year. At least this year. You don't have to do it because are you giving enough effort to what is important? Where are your people lined up to? What initiatives are they working on? Do you have enough resources to deliver those? This is just a good exercise to do. Next, I'm going to talk about individual performance. Now, this is a chart I did many years ago, 2006, and I have two versions of it. One version lists the solutions. This version lists the questions. So here we have causes for individual performance failures. Now, I'm not saying these are every single cause in the world but I'll say these are a very strong grouping of causes, and it shows a bit of the sequence, or if you will, a chain reaction that if one thing breaks down, let's say, for instance, you break down in the area of uh, you know, resources, if you really don't have the resources to support, 
You can be doing the best behaviors in the world, but you don't have the resources, the time is a resource, and you don't have the support of people, your great efforts are lost. If you have psychological issues in terms of your, your confidence, if in terms of your um, you know, concerns and your insecurities and your fears, no matter what expectations I tell you about the work, you're going to have a hard time performing them. Now, I put a bar there because there's some psychological challenges that can come after you told expectations. <laughs> so if I was working for somebody and they told me all these expectations, man, I can have, <laughs> I can have fear, I can have insecurity, I can have doubt, I can have a lot of problems based on maybe too high of expectations. But knowledge and skills, motivation, resources, goes down to even the root level of do I even feel like, or have I been given the authority to do this, or do I have the influence to be able to even do this work? Locus of control. How many, raise your hand if you know what locus of control means, if you've heard that term. Only a few, okay. What it, it, what it means is this. When I look at the world and I look at the impact I have, and I look at my job, let's say, and I'm working in this job and I'm told to do uh, succession planning meetings. Okay. The locus of control, if it's internal, means that I believe that I have a lot of influence on the outcome of this. I can do things, make choices, do behaviors that can really make a difference at the success of this meeting, that it's really up, mostly up to me. That's an internal locus of control. I have the knowledge, skills, ability, and my decisions and my efforts will make a big difference. An external locus of control says, well, maybe I know how to do succession planning meetings, but I don't feel like I have much control here. I feel like what I do is not going to make much of a difference. It's really about the, the president of the company supporting this. No, it's really about the HR giving me the right resources. It's really about, you know, this, this, and this. And if I feel that I'm helpless in the situation, that I don't have much control, then I will not likely make the effort to make the difference. And so people with an external locus of control are worried about the external factors that can limit them. And then they won't be as effective. So take time to look at this chart, and let's go to the tables again. If you would tell me what is what you think in your company are the one or two biggest causes for individuals not performing well. Is it knowledge and skills, that they really don't have the skill sets? You were saying that earlier, or the experience, if you will, okay? The experience to do it. Okay, that would be the knowledge, getting the experience. Is it people are not motivated? And no matter how good they are, they're really not motivated to make the effort. Or do you just have a lack, lack of resources? There's not enough people on the person's team to make any difference, really. Or do they have bad behaviors? They're ineffective. They're not working. They're distracted. They're, um, they're anger issues. There's de depression issues. There's, you know, I mean, there could be many behavior issues. So take just a, a few minutes to talk to your table. What failure causes do you think shows up most often in your people, on your team, people you directly work with that you observe? Take a few minutes to talk about it.
Okay, take only about one more minute to share and talk about this. And I'll, again, I'll ask for uh, maybe two tables to share. So raise your hand now if you think your table would like to share. And we'll get a mic to you to get ready. Okay, your, your table behind here. Okay. Is this your table? Okay, good. Yep. Let's get a mic to this table in front. Good. Give me another table. Who else wants to share? Raise your hand if your table wants to share a point or two. Okay. Back here, that hand's raised. If you can get a mic to the gentleman back here. If you raise your hand again, make sure they get a mic to you. Right here. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, we have two tables we're going to share. What they see is performance. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm representing Love in Nobel Bank in the crowd. Uh, I think I might be the youngest one here, and I am the youngest member in my team. Okay. Uh, talking about the individual performance failure in case of a young generation or Gen Z's or millennials in particular. Yes. I think it comes down to a motivation. I to think which one? Motivation. Motivation. Uh, okay. Uh, if we see that uh, going abroad has been a common trend in our country, and if we compare the our friends or our family uh, friend circles that has gone abroad are earning competitively high and doing much better economically and in professionally as compared to us who are sitting here. So that key factor, that key differences, really demotivates me and uh, people of our generation in general. So that's where I believe the performance failures occurs for Gen Z's or uh, young people. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Let's have a pause here. That's a good point. The motivations, and I'm hearing this younger generation theme come out a bit. And uh, I know that this conference was also selective that they didn't let some of the younger people come to the conference. So maybe we should hear from them someday. All right, in the back here, this gentleman. Salah. Yes, sir. Salah. Uh, Hello. I, oh, sorry. Ew. Uh, we also uh, uh, came to the conclusion that motivation was one of the major issues. Oh, wow. Uh, but motivation in the respect of a kind of a bad manager where if someone does a good job, he's not uh, recognized by the manager. And if, if someone does a bad one, then there's no accountability also. So there's a oh. ten the tendency for people to, you know, the individual to procrastinate their work. There's no deadlines. Or even if deadlines are not met, you know, the system is such that uh, it is not uh, recognized that well. So. That yeah. does not motivate people to, you know, give their best. That's a, that's a great point. Thank you. Remember, what was that word I had, uh, the last sentence on the slide about performance? I said, this is more important than a performance rating. What was it? Feedback. Feedback, feedback is more important than performance ratings. And what you're talking about, like recognition is feedback. And accountability is feedback. Asking where it's at, meeting the deadline, where, where, you know, where are you at with this thing? All that's very important. It's hard for people to be a good performer if they never receive feedback. Especially if they're young and they're new at what they do. Now, I've, you know, in my 50s, I've, I've done this HR stuff for a long time. I don't need as much feedback because I know if my stuff is being successful or not. I've done it before. I'm, I know what to look for. I can still enjoy some feedback and appreciate it. But earlier in your career, you live and die by feedback. You need to get it. You need to know. It would, I'll just ask, anyone else want to share from the table what they came up with? Okay, go ahead. Uh, I'd like to share uh, something. Uh, in Nepal, it's when generalizing this job scenario, what people generally do is they take the jobs, uh, whichever comes in front of them, okay. or where the employer accept them, right? Okay. So they are experimenting with the jobs. Yeah, so that's the why reason their interest may not match with the job itself, and maybe that is the major reason for the failure for their performance failure. Okay, so let's, let's dig into this. You say they're, they're experiencing, they're, they move around in jobs too fast, too quickly, okay. Too quickly, and uh, they are experimenting with jobs. Experimenting because, uh, with they them, are yeah. not getting job as per their no, uh, education background or their expertise, and they are uh, doing job whatever comes in front of them. Yeah. 
That's wow. the major reason. Yeah, that's a good point. And there is a danger with moving too quickly that you do not see the impact of your work or the impact of your results, and you do not build relationships where you get a lot of the honest feedback, and there's a lot of issues with that. I know when I was coming out of college, I had a mentor who was an executive in a company, and he talked to me a little bit. And I remember one of his things was, okay, Steve, when you go into companies, five years is a good target time to at least stay minimum five years. I don't think you can tell that to a young person today. I think it's maybe like, say, two years or three. It's much faster to move. But I'm seeing a lot of people who reach out to me on LinkedIn having one to two years experience as, as pretty common, which I think could be you know, not as effective. It can still be effective, I think at least a year. But I'll tell you, one person um, in a company I was working for, the young lady was enticed by a title and a little more money. And it wasn't a ton more money, and it wasn't a ton of much bigger. And she left the company under a year, like literally eight months. She left for a little more title, a little more money. And I was like, you're in a great spot. You're doing good work. You, you, people are going to wonder, why would you leave after eight months? You know? But she did. All right. We've talked through a few of these things here. So we'll move on to the next topic, which is estimating potential. Estimating potential. Now, when you're talking about potential, you really should begin with this question. Potential for what? Because what kind of job are you good at? Now, if you want to say, what's my potential of being a concert pianist, I'll tell you, I don't have high potential to be a concert pianist. I, 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 I've played some musical instruments, not particularly well, you know, um, and that's low potential for me. Certain other people, they'll be a great concert pianist. They would put in the effort, the time it takes to really hone that skill, the commitment. Now, if you talk about my potential to be a salesperson, okay, or if you talk about my potential to be an HR leader, or talk about my potential to be... You know, board members, okay, it's a little different. I had the right experience. I had the right commitment. I had the right skills. But always think about when you're measuring potential, what potential are we looking for? Are we looking for technical potential or leadership potential? The ability to handle complex challenges at work, problems, solve our technical issues, or to lead the organization. Now, be careful of models. And I, when I mean models, I don't mean like a schematic or a diagram. I mean models like a person. Because so often a company has a great leader, and they say, that's our model leader. We need another one of this right here. Someone who's just as charismatic, just as good looking, just as strong, same kind of education, went to the same schools, did the same kind of work, and we think that that's the one answer to our whole organization. It's not. There are different ways of succeeding. Now, I'm not saying don't look at those people who've really been successful Look at them. Look at their skills. Look at their experience. Look at what developed them and prepared them for that role. But you often have to consider what were their situation when they went into the job. Some people had a great turnaround, and their skill set led them to be a great turnaround leader where they really rebuilt and reshaped an organization. Some people have great skills at being an entrepreneur and particularly startups. So they're great at starting a company, but when the company gets to a certain maturity or size, they're not the best manager of that kind of company. And other people, they've managed great, large organizations, but you put them into a startup, and they fail because they don't have the structure and support systems that a large organization gives them. So you got to be careful about the models. Now, when you compare people for potential, because that's essentially what you're doing, is looking at multiple people and saying, who has more potential to move out? How are they among their peers? Be careful that's a peer group. If you compare young employees with five years' experience against employees with 20 years of experience, it's not a fair compare group, all right? You want to find among peer groups. And when I look at peer groups, if you can, try to get at least 10 people to compare them to, if possible. Eight, nine, 10 minimum. Um, now, psychometrics. Basically, what you see in an individual is going to be filtered by your perception, by your bias, by what you think you know about the person. And we all have biases, whether we admit it or not. It's just part of life. We like certain traits. We don't like certain traits. We respect certain values. We really get offended by other values. Um, we are attracted to the person. We think they're wonderful. Now, in psychometrics, you're having the person evaluate themselves. Perhaps the psychometric is measuring an aptitude like inductive reasoning or you know, um, pattern recognition. 
This is a great aptitude to measure, and it has a lot of validity to it in terms of people dealing with complex, ambiguous situations. Other types of tests might measure your numerical ability, your um, aptitude for reasoning skills, your aptitude for reading comprehension. There's so many aptitude tests and uh, measurements you can have. But you're also measuring personality factors, likes and dislikes and preferences and likelihoods. And this is important. But when you're measuring potential, always try to get some psychometrics in the mix. And when you get psychometrics, don't just get the latest thing off the internet that has 10 questions and tells you everyone they're wonderful. That's not a great test. Look for those that are highly valid, like companies from SHL, Corn Ferry, um, you know, number of companies out there give good psychometric tests. The other thing you work about is this. Potential with experience is powerful, but potential without experience is undeveloped. Okay? What I'm saying is, you need to send people with experience into some of the most challenging work you have. Why is that? Who wants to give a thought on that? Why should people with high potential be given some of the most challenging assignments, some of the most, some of the most challenging tasks? Just raise your hand and share. Yes? They just have the drive to do it. They have the drive to do it. Okay, good. And with that drive might come the... the, the the interest, the, the commitment, the passion. Very good, very good answer. Anyone else? Yes, in the back, if you can speak loud. Go ahead. Go ahead, just speak up. Okay, go ahead. Hello. Okay, yes. Uh, it's please. just a short word, like sentence. Um, I believe uh, it's just to keep them engaged because if they are high potential, uh, they have to be keep, mo keep motivated to be in the company. So just to keep them engaged. Absolutely, absolutely. People can know that they're, they have potential because they are feeling like they can do more than what they're doing. They're feeling like they can you know, make a bigger contribution, that they're not challenged enough, they're not engaged enough or interested enough. This is so true. And, and I've worked for some strong companies with some very, very high potential people, Microsoft, Johnson Johnson, Cisco Systems, Kraft Foods, and I've watched high potentials for many years, and I've been in the conversations about them. And I can tell you that we, we find a lot of satisfied high potential people when they're given big challenges. They're not necessarily satisfied that I'm winning at everything, but that I'm really challenged. I'm really thinking. I'm really engaged. And that's so important. Anyone else want to contribute, and then we'll move on. Okay, remember that slide I showed at the beginning where we read about it? The de that development is a demand pull? That's a lot about high potentials. Get them in a situation that demands their effort, that demands that they really have to use their brain and think, use their aptitudes, that demands that the way I used to do it won't work. I have to try harder, try something new, try something different, approach it a different way, that demands that they have to develop some new knowledge. This is going to develop them. Now, one of the mistakes that companies keep is, especially if they have not many employees, so I understand if you're in a company that has, say, 20 employees, 30 employees, that sometimes this one person is all you have in your company to do this one task. And you might want to keep them in that task. But if they have high potential and you don't move them eventually, what's going to happen? That great person who's doing this task, and maybe that task is leading your sales team or managing your, coordinating your operations. But if that's all they're doing, they're going to eventually get bored. And they might go up road. Or they might just go to another company and use those skills. But if you move them, maybe you don't have them in that same important task, but you still have them in your company, still contributing. So have someone else learn how to do it. Don't be afraid to move around these people who are high potential. Because if you don't, you're more likely to lose them. So... Here is a, um, a list of factors that after I've worked in a couple companies and we've talked about high potentials for many years, I put this list together. And I believe it has a lot of the key elements in estimating potential. Estimating potential. 
When we talk about estimating, again, you might not have exactly the answer, but based on what you know about the person, you think they have certain potential. Now, what are you estimating them for? In your company, you're essentially estimating them, if they're a technical person, how much more technical complexity can they manage? But if they're leadership, how high of a leader can they be? Do we see the skills that they could be a leader at, a, at the next level above where they're at right now? Say it's a director level. Or do we see the skills for even an executive, a vice president? What I strongly recommend, though, is do not estimate above two levels of performance or two levels in the organization. And why is, why is that? It's because the jobs are very, very different when you go up in an organization. You have to be careful. Are we seeing enough today to truly estimate three levels above? My argument is rarely will you do that. The best chance you have if you want to go three levels above is if the person has worked at other companies at a higher level and had a great track record at those other companies at a higher level. But if, if it's just been at your company, watch those two levels. That's about as high as you can estimate with, with accuracy because of the nature of the work. Now, motivation. We've talked about this. Career, interest, and direction. Passion for and commitment to company mission. Effort, perseverance, attitude. Some studies have said that those last things, effort, perseverance, and attitude, are more impactful on performance than your knowledge and skills. And I agree. Because if... Experimenting with the jobs. Yeah, so that's the why reason their interest may not match with the job itself, and maybe that is the major reason for the failure, for their performance failure. Okay, so let's, let's dig into this. You say they're, they're experiencing, they're, they move around in jobs too fast? Too quickly, okay. Too quickly, and uh, they are experimenting with jobs. Experimenting because, uh, with they are them, not yeah. getting job as per their no, uh, education background or their expertise, and they are uh, doing job whatever comes in front of them. Yeah. And that's wow. the major reason. Yeah, that's a good point. And there is a danger with moving too quickly that you do not see the impact of your work or the impact of your results, and you do not build relationships where you get a lot of the honest feedback, and there's a lot of issues with that. I know when I was coming out of college, I had a mentor who was an executive in a company, and he talked to me a little bit. And I remember one of his things was, okay, Steve, when you go into companies, five years is a good target time to at least stay minimum five years. I don't think you tell that to a young person today. I think it's maybe like, say, two years or three. It's much faster to move. But I'm seeing a lot of people who reach out to me on LinkedIn having one to two years experience as, as pretty common, which I think could be you know, not as effective. It can still be effective, I think, at least a year. But I'll tell you, one person um, in a company I was working for, the young lady was enticed by a title and a little more money. And it wasn't a ton more money, and it wasn't a ton of much bigger. And she left the company what, under a year, like literally eight months. She left for a little more title, a little more money. And I was like, you're in a great spot. You're doing good work. You, you, people are going to wonder, why would you leave after eight months? You know? But she did. All right, we've talked through a few of these things here, so we'll move on to the next topic, which is estimating potential. Estimating potential. Now, when you're talking about potential, you really should begin with this question. Potential for what? Because what kind of job are you good at? Now, if you want to say, what's my potential of being a concert pianist, I'll tell you, I don't have high potential to be a concert pianist. I, I, I've played some musical instruments, not particularly well, you know, um, and that's low potential for me. Certain other people, they'll be a great concert pianist. They would put in the effort, the time it takes to really hone that skill, the commitment. Now, if you talk about my potential to be a salesperson, okay, or if you talk about my potential to be an HR leader, or talk about my potential to be, you know, board members, okay, it's a little different. I had the right experience. I had the right commitment. I had the right skills. But always think about when you're measuring potential, what potential are we looking for? Are we looking for technical potential or leadership potential? The ability to handle complex challenges at work, problems, solve our technical issues, or to lead the organization. Now, be careful of models. And I, when I mean models, I don't mean like a schematic or a diagram. I mean models like a person. Because so often a company has a great leader, and they say, that's our model leader. We need another one of this right here. Someone who's just as charismatic, just as good looking, just as strong, same kind of education, went to the same schools, did the same kind of work, and we think that that's the one answer to our whole organization. It's not. There are different ways of succeeding. 
Now, I'm not saying don't look at those people who've really been successful. Look at them. Look at their skills. Look at their experience. Look at what developed them and prepared them for that role. But you often have to consider what were their situation when they went into the job. Some people had a great turnaround, and their skill set led them to be a great turnaround leader where they really rebuilt and reshaped an organization. Some people have great skills at being an entrepreneur, and particularly startups. So they're great at starting a company, but when the company gets to a certain maturity or size, they're not the best manager of that kind of company. And other people, they've managed great, large organizations, but you put them into a startup, and they fail because they don't have the structure and support systems that a large organization gives them. So you got to be careful about the models. Now, when you compare people for potential, because that's essentially what you're doing, is looking at multiple people and saying, who has more potential to move out? How are they among their peers? Be careful that's a peer group. If you compare young employees with five years' experience against employees with 20 years of experience, it's not a fair compare group, all right? You want to find among peer groups. And when I look at peer groups, if you can, try to get at least 10 people to compare them to, if possible. Eight, nine, 10 minimum. Um, now, psychometrics. Basically, what you see in an individual is going to be filtered by your perception, by your bias, by what you think you know about the person. And we all have biases, whether we admit it or not. It's just part of life. We like certain traits. We don't like certain traits. We respect certain values. We really get offended by other values. Um, we are attracted to the person. We think they're wonderful. Now, in psychometrics, you're having the person evaluate themselves. Perhaps the psychometric is measuring an aptitude like inductive reasoning or you know, um, pattern recognition. This is a great aptitude to measure, and it has a lot of validity to it in terms of people dealing with complex, ambiguous situations. Other types of tests might measure your numerical ability, your um, aptitude for reasoning skills, your aptitude for reading comprehension. There's so many aptitude tests and uh, measurements you can have. But you're also measuring personality factors, likes and dislikes and preferences and likelihoods. And this is important. But when you're measuring potential, always try to get some psychometrics in the mix. And when you get psychometrics, don't just get the latest thing off the internet that has 10 questions and tells you everyone they're wonderful. That's not a great test. Look for those that are highly valid, like companies from SHL, Corn Ferry, um, you know, number of companies out there give good psychometric tests. The other thing you work about is this. Potential with experience is powerful. But potential without experience is undeveloped, OK? What I'm saying is you need to send people with experience into some of the most challenging work you have. Why is that? Who wants to give a thought on that? Why should people with high potential be given some of the most challenging assignments, some of the most challenging tasks? Just raise your hand and share. Yes. They have the drive to do it. OK, good. And with that drive might come the, 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 the interest, the, the commitment, the passion. Very good. Very good answer. Anyone else? Yes, in the back, if you can speak loud. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just speak up. OK, go ahead. Hello. OK, yes, uh, It's please. just a short word, like sentence. Um, I believe uh, it's just to keep them engaged, because if they are high potential, uh, they have to be keep, mo keep motivated to be in the company. So just to keep them engaged. Absolutely, absolutely. People can know that they're, they have potential, because they are feeling like they can do more than what they're doing. They're feeling like they can you know, make a bigger contribution, that they're not challenged enough, they're not engaged enough or interested enough. This is so true. And, and I've worked for some strong companies with some very, very high potential people, Microsoft, Johnson Johnson, Cisco Systems, Kraft Foods. And I've watched high potentials for many years, and I've been in the conversations about them. And I can tell you that we, we find a lot of satisfied high potential people when they're given big challenges. They're not necessarily satisfied that I'm winning at everything, but that I'm really challenged. I'm really thinking, I'm really engaged, and that's so important. Anyone else want to contribute, and then we'll move on. 
Okay, remember that slide I showed at the beginning where we read about it? The, de that development is a demand pull? That's a lot about high potentials. Get them in a situation that demands their effort, that demands that they really have to use their brain and think, use their aptitudes, that demands that the way I used to do it won't work. I have to try harder, try something new, try something different, approach it a different way. That demands that they have to develop some new knowledge. This is going to develop them. Now, one of the mistakes that companies keep is, especially if they have not many employees. So I understand if you're in a company that has, say, 20 employees, 30 employees, that sometimes this one person is all you have in your company to do this one task. And you might want to keep them in that task. But if they have high potential and you don't move them eventually, what's going to happen? That great person who's doing this task, and maybe that task is leading your sales team or managing your, coordinating your operations. But if that's all they're doing, they're going to eventually get bored. And they might go up road. Or they might just go to another company and use those skills. But if you move them, maybe you don't have them in that same important task, but you still have them in your company, still contributing. So have someone else learn how to do it. Don't be afraid to move around these people who are high potential. Because if you don't, you're more likely to lose them. So here is a, um, a list of factors that after I've worked in a couple companies and we've talked about high potentials for many years, I put this list together. And I believe it has a lot of the key elements in estimating potential. Estimating potential. When we talk about estimating, again, you might not have exactly the answer, but based on what you know about the person, you think they have certain potential. Now, what are you estimating them for? In your company, you're essentially estimating them if they're a technical person, how much more technical complexity can they manage? But if they're leadership, how high of a leader can they be? Do we see the skills that they could be a leader at, a, at the next level above where they're at right now? Say it's a director level. Or do we see the skills for even an executive, a vice president? What I strongly recommend, though, is do not estimate above two levels of performance or two levels in the organization. And why is, why is that? It's because the jobs are very, very different when you go up in an organization. You have to be careful. Are we seeing enough today to truly estimate three levels above? My argument is rarely will you do that. The best chance you have if you want to go three levels above is if the person has worked at other companies at a higher level and had a great track record at those other companies at a higher level. But if, if it's just been at your company, watch those two levels. That's about as high as you can estimate with, with accuracy because of the nature of the work. Now, motivation. We've talked about this. Career, interest, and direction. Passion for and commitment to company mission. Effort, perseverance, attitude. Some studies have said that those last things, effort, perseverance, and attitude, are more impactful on performance than your knowledge and skills. And I agree. Because if you have the knowledge and skills and you don't put a good effort forward, you might not be successful. But if you don't really have much knowledge and skills, by your effort, you, you have a little trial and error, you have a little bit of practice, you make some mistakes, but guess what? What are you doing when you're making that trial and error in the mistakes? You're learning. You're getting better. You're getting practice. You're getting experience. And they'll eventually get there. Now, achievements. This is important. Have they made quality decisions? If someone's not making good decisions, they don't have much potential, okay? I'll just tell you that right now. If they make unwise, poor decisions. I love this. Back in early in my career, uh, first company I really worked for, I made it to C-Corp, a Siemens and Corning company. Someone asked the uh, director of our division, you know, hey, uh, what do you look for in uh, leadership potential people? He said, simple. Do they make good decisions? And you know what? I agree. That's a big one. Not the only factor, but that's a big one. Next is delivered through others. And by the way, on decisions, no one's going to make great decisions all the time. But do they learn from the bad decisions? That's important. And do they eventually start making more quality decisions? Uh, delivery through others. Can they work through others? Or are they just doing it all themselves? Uh, complexity of the work. Development challenges. Results delivered. Achievements. What have they really gotten done? How do they get it done? Do others still want to work with the person? That's important. Or do people try to leave this person and get away? Watch for that. 
Relationships, so essential. Essentially, when you get into higher levels, you're not doing all the work yourself. No vice president or president of a company is out there getting all the things done themselves. What they have to look for is, how do I help others get it done? Your ability to have a good relationship with someone matters a lot in your ability to influence them. Your ability to influence them guides and directs their behaviors and their actions and their commitment and their efforts. If you have poor relationships, people don't want to listen to you, even if you have authority, believe it or not. Even if you have that authority. And I'll trust me, you don't want to be the leader who has to keep on firing people because they don't do what you want. You want to be the leader who people don't want to leave you. In Microsoft, um, I, was lead I created this uh, senior leadership team, people just below the executive level. And we were talking about leadership, and I came up with what they loved as a definition for leadership. Because I was tired of people saying, I'm a leader, I'm a leader, yeah, I'm a leader. I'm, you know, everybody wants to be called a leader, right? No? I mean, we find that in today's world, right? I'm, everybody's raising their hand, I'm a leader. And I said this, so you're a leader. Let me ask you one question only. Who is following you? That's my only question. Who is following you? Can you as a leader, I'm not talking position authority, I'm talking you as an individual, look behind you and say, this person, this person, this person are watching my behaviors, emulating me, and doing what I'm doing because they're following me. Or these people are doing the work that I'm asking them to do. They're following me. These people are accomplishing the things I'm asking them to do. They're following me. If you have no followers, you are not a leader. Think about it. You might be a great vision person, and your vision and idea is great, but who's, who's adopting it? Who's following it? Who is listening to you? I think you walk into any kind of bookstore, and there's probably 100 books on leadership. Probably no books on following, but we need good followers. And a great leader has followers. And the best leaders have followers who are not under their direct authority, but are people who respect that person, listen to the person, follow the behaviors, the ideas, the direction that person's going in. Capability. Let's be honest. As you go up in an organization, the work is more challenging. As Shell, I would watch this VP, and we used to talk about these meetings we're going to go to quarterly when I was in the American region, and he literally could have this much paper to read before that meeting, literally, because there's so many things he had to review, so many things he had to understand, and Shell loved paperwork and knowledge and all this, and, 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 and Steve, the name of the leader here, was just had a lot of demand to really grasp this stuff because he's going to be asked to make decisions, so he had to read it. In senior positions, the demand for you to really grasp knowledge quickly understand it, perceive what's important, differentiate what's not important, also pick up the patterns that are going as so you understand where this might be headed is vital. No leader wants to be the, um, let's just put it frankly, the weakest person in the room, the one who doesn't get it, the one who doesn't understand, the one who can't seem to grasp what's going on. What's going to happen in your leadership if you're one of those people? Nothing good. So leaders have to have the capability. When you measure people for senior positions, are they bright enough, smart enough, capable enough? Do they have the background experience to really figure things out? And can they pull out the best from others? If I'm a leader and I don't have the intellectual capacity of my team, I'm going to have a hard time pushing them to be at their best if I can't figure out what they're doing or understand what they're telling me. So you have to look at that as a leader. And finally, others. Very important. What's your impact on other people? Are you able to assess their talent, record direct uh, reports um, of being put out of the group? At Johnson & Johnson, one of the requirements for people to move from a director to a vice president was this requirement. And it was very hard to achieve. The requirement is, how many people under that director have been promoted outside of that group? In other words, they were so good at what they were doing that others took them and used them in their group. If you're a director and you got great results and you had people who really liked you, 
but none of your people seem to be ready to move out of your group or have the skill set to move out. You are not being promoted to vice president. That's a hard one. Because we want to say anyone who's going to move up in the organization and manage a larger group needs to be a developer of people, needs to be a leader that can develop their people so strong that these people can do other work. They can't hoard their talent. And they, can't be, they have to be people who grow their people. And there were promotions that were denied, not because they had bad results or were not capable people or had the achievements and the track record or even were unmotivated. They were motivated people. But because they did not have people grow out of their organization, they weren't promoted to vice president. Take time at your table to look at this chart, because it's important about potential. Where do you think your company is challenged the most in having people with potential? Do you think you have a capability challenge, that you wish you had more capable people? Or is it motivation that was mentioned earlier? You really think that there's a motivation issue? Or do you think that, you know, the relationship factor is struggling? Or that people are not helping develop other people? Think about leaders. And by the way, I use this potential for individual contributors and technical roles. I use MARC, Motivation, Achievement, Relationships, Capacity, Capability. When it's a leader of people, I use others. So it's MARC and MARCO is the formula, okay? But just take a little bit of time to talk to your table about this and, and share. And if you don't want to share your company, just say, I think Nepal or Kathmandu, this is one of the bigger challenges. Uh-oh, we need that slide, though. <laughs> okay, remember it. MARCO. So take some time now to talk to your table and share where you think the biggest challenge is for potential. Take just a few minutes.
Okay, we're going to ask for a few tables of volunteers, so start thinking about it. If you're going to want to share something that's talked about your table. This is so important because I believe Nepal has the potential leaders. You just got to be able to develop them. Raise your hand if you, uh, first table, raise your hand for sharing something on the, okay, you've got the back right there, so we'll get someone in the back. Let's have the second table. Who's, who else wants to share on this, okay? We've got on this end right here at the very other end, okay, so we got two spots. All right, go on the last table here. Which table wants to share? All right, up here, right here, right here. Okay, is there a fourth one just checking? Okay, we got three? All right, we got a third one up here, we got one back there, one back here. Okay, so the question is, which of these elements in potential do you think is most concerning or lacking in your area of the country? Let's have it right back here, um, the first person here. Yeah, we discussed in group, we're from three companies, and uh, we pretty much uh, agreed on two of the things here. One would be motivation. Okay, that keeps uh, coming up, motivation does. Yeah, motivation, particularly for career interest and direction. Uh, that could be one of the potential factor. And okay. the second one would be relationship, because high potential will uh, pretty much will have and characteristics of, uh, you know, uh, of having lacked on influencing skills, might uh -huh. not be always positive. And also we felt uh, presence and emotional intelligence, because uh, if, we, if we have to work on a, in a team, definitely we'll have to understand the uh, to understand the teams, uh, you know, uh, the characteristics and how they feel. So in terms of driving them, uh, they might have a, a potential factor in driving a good relationship. Okay, that's some excellent feedback. I really appreciate that. You, you, you pinpointed some things. And that, that first thing you mentioned, career, interest, and direction. One of the things that's critical for high potentials is they want to know where they're going. They want to know, can I really eventually achieve my potential here? We had a high potential at J&J, Johnson & Johnson, that we, she was going to leave us, and in that conversation, the boss said, hold it, hold it, you don't know the plans we have for you. You're doing wonderful here. We are high potential. We're gonna, you might be a president in five years or three years or something like that. And she's like, I stayed because I didn't know that. I wasn't feeling like, I didn't know I had this kind of recognition from people that they really saw me as this strong. And fortunately, she stayed. And I think great things happened in her career, but that was so important. Thank you so much for sharing on that. Thank you. All right. Um, over here, we have the second person down on this end, in the back. All right. And we have the third person going to be up here. Let's get the mic to the third person. Get the third person ready. Good. Okay. All right. Please. We talked about lack of emotional intelligence okay. and the ability to separate your personal and your professional life. Like we might have a great personal relationship with someone, but we, if we start expecting favors in the professional life, that's again unfair. Mm -hmm. And the second point was lack of motivation. We rely on external factors to motivate us, but we see that people lack intrinsic motivation. Okay, good. Again, okay, I like that. The emotional intelligence and the motivation. I'm hearing... A <coughs> Excuse me. I'm hearing motivation come up a lot, which is interesting for this country right now. And we might look at those deeper issues sometime to say, is it the environment they're in that they don't feel the opportunities here? Or is it a lack of the companies giving the people the opportunities and investing in them? All right? Uh, the third person up, up here... All right, thank you. Um, so our team, we uh, decided upon relationship, achievement, and motivation. Okay. So in terms of relationship, it's, um, it, it also kind of intrinsically um, relates to motivation as well. So um, in terms of achievement, we, we talked about how, uh, as you mentioned, that we need to, mm -hmm. a leader needs to develop their own team members. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we talked about. Okay. Now, uh, the, a leader needs to develop their own team. It's like the others category, right? The achievement. Deliver. Achievement category. Okay, just lost it there. 
The achievement category is so important because, you know, you hear this all the time in financial markets that past performance does not indicate what? Future performance. Because no one buying a stock wants to say, we'll guarantee you just as much success in the future as we had in the past. But with individuals, the past achievements make a big difference in potential for future achievements. If people have been successful in the past doing this kind of work, they can very likely be successful in the same kind of work. It's a very good indicator for that. So it's, a, it's, it's one of those things where you want to look for that track record. That's the basis of resumes. The basis of resumes is not your personality. They're not looking at They might figure out a little bit about your personality by your resume, but it's what? What have you done? What have you achieved? What were your responsibilities? What have you learned? Good. So Mark and Marco is a powerful tool to estimate potential. Now I'm going to give you some tools to think about how to apply this. Now, part of the potential is learning agility. This was popular 20 years ago, 25 years ago when it came out. And you'll see different aspects here, but I want to just summarize it in this. Learning agility is really saying, are you adaptable to learn in every challenging situation? Because if you're not adaptable to learn in that challenging situation, the challenge may just beat you up, <laughs> right? You might just get beat up in that challenge. If you think, I'm going to do it my way, this is how I've always done it, it's worked for me three times before, darn it, it's going to work a fourth time. I'm going to approach it this way. I'm not going to listen to my team. I'm not going to pay attention to what's different about the situation. I'm just going to apply the same thing I've done before. And by brute force, it will work. Some leaders might not say that, but they act like that. Okay? But the adaptable ones figure out maybe something's new about the situation. Maybe the economy's in a different situation. Maybe our customers are not where they were before. Maybe there's a new technology that we should pay attention to. Right? Instead of using the old technology the same way 50 different times, maybe there's a new technology. How many in this room do not have a smartphone? I'm talking they have a flip-up phone or they don't have any kind of mobile phone. Anyone? No one wants to admit it? <laughs> I think I know one person in my life who doesn't have a smartphone <laughs> but has a little flip-up mobile phone. That's one of those things that changed. And I was in, the, um, in Microsoft when we bought Nokia. Oh, man, not the best buy in 2011. Nokia was going down. They didn't adapt to the smartphone. Motorola did not adapt to the smartphone. But if you go back to 2007, 2006, 2008, Motorola and Nokia were the top dogs in the, in the phone industry, mobile phone industry. But they didn't adapt. RIM was the top dog emerging in 205, 206, but guess what? They didn't adapt either. You need to adapt. These are just characteristics of people who are highly learning agile. Now, remember I talked about assessments. I talked about psychometrics with uh, potential. Here's one that's good. I'm not saying everyone should use this, but this is a good one. This is the Hogan's instrument. Hogan's, okay, takes a look at these, a number of these factors, okay? Excitable, skeptical, cautious, reserved, leisurely. And what they're doing is they're describing behaviors, things that people do, things that they act out. Now, these 11 behaviors, they can be good. They can be okay. But they also have what you call a dark side, meaning that if they're used too much, they can cause some damage. Now, they will give you scores like this right here is two examples. And what they come up with a score of 90 or higher, it means you're at risk. It means it's highly likely that given stress, that this behavior will turn into something that's negative. Okay? You follow me on this? So, 98, leisurely. In a stressful situation, this can show up. And the kind of behaviors that might show up is have good social skills and make a positive impression, okay, fine, but seems cooperative but convertly mistrust. Probably they can overuse this behavior right here. They can become irritated. They can procrastinate. They can privately challenge the, the competence of management, and they can be subversive. Leisurely, this one too much can be subversive. Diligent too much can be, become a too much micromanager, try to do everything equally well, they're hard to please. They are uncomfortable with ambiguity. 
they press for concrete actions, and they become very frustrating to work for if they're too diligent, too demanding on their team. Their team got the job done, but guess what? They don't want to work with this person anymore, even though they got the job done with them and had good performance. They achieved their goals. So the Hogan's instrument, I do recommend when you're looking at potential, because if it's leadership potential, not prof- we're not talking this much professional, technical potential, but leadership potential, this can indicate some risk factors that you need to pay attention to and make the person aware of so that they know that, you know what, in stressful situations, this might come out. And if this comes out regularly, it can damage you as a leader. So when you look at the 11 definitions, you can see here, you can see a description followed by a result. So you look down here, we have, um, you know, what's the result of a highly skeptical? They lack, uh, seems to lack trust. Result of a highly excitable, seems to lack persistence because they're moving on to the next thing. Highly cautious, seems to resistant to change or reluctant to make changes. Highly reserved, seems to be a poor communicator. All these things can result in poor leadership if used too much and out of context or becomes basically um, a derailleur for the person. And look, I'm not saying that you'll find a perfect leader who has no score above 90. Some great leaders have scores above 90. But they manage it. They manage it. They know their risk. They know their tendency. If you know that you can become angry when people don't deliver work, and you're going to a meeting where you don't feel the team's delivered, you might want to work with yourself and say, okay, I'm going to try not to yell at them. (laughs) Okay? I'm going to try not to yell. A, a true story, a president of a company, I don't want to tell you which one, I, I personally worked at this company, um, would have a tendency in meetings to be um, very strong with people, bold to say the least. He would actually raise his voice and embarrass people if they didn't deliver well. If they reported bad numbers, he would yell at them in front of their peers in the executive meeting. It wasn't uncommon. It didn't happen all the time, but it really wasn't that uncommon. Well, guess what happens? No one wants to be yelled at in front of their peers in a meeting, right? So this one manufacturing site had a problem. They didn't want to talk about it. They were kind of like, hey, let's let's figure this problem out and fix it ourselves. Let's not bring it up in the management committee. They hid the problem for a month, trying to work it out themselves and solve it. Well, sooner or later, finance ratted them out because finance shows the numbers. And all of a sudden, the numbers are bad. And they couldn't hide the problem anymore. And they had to bring up what was going on. Well, that leader was under stress from, C- from, from the big corporate world, okay, to say, you know, you better deliver these numbers. And he, because he did not know about the problem, he couldn't warn them about the issues and could not warn them about the shortfall in revenue and the shortfall in profits. It was interesting. The word is, he was so mad at that meeting once the numbers came out that he didn't yell, he didn't berate them, he didn't put them down, he just sat there silently. And he said, you just brought down this company. And the reality is, it was underneath a conglomerate, and that conglomerate shut them down within five months of that. Within five months, they shut them down. Partly because they weren't meeting the expectations. They were thinking about... If they can meet these kind of targets, we'll keep them going. Otherwise, we'll distribute their products to other companies and save the money by shutting them down. That was a lot of problems. If that leader had not been so damaging to the people in the meetings, they probably would have talked about the issues in time, gotten some other ideas, maybe even got some more help to solve the issues. But hiding it because they didn't want that leader to react the way he reacts, shut down the company eventually. True story. I don't want to share which company, but true story. Test your leaders in situations with experiences, with challenging assignments, but also test them with psychometric. Help them become self-aware so they don't self-destruct. Next. At the end of the day, you want to differentiate your talent. If I was to be asked, you know, what's one word to describe talent management, I'd simply say this, it's differentiation. You need to differentiate your talent. What are they good at, what are they not good at, who's the best, who's not so good, because you want to manage your talent in a way that helps develop them and gets the most out of them. This is one example of a, of a most often you hear nine box. This is a nine box right here. 
I like to use an 11 box because I don't think the 9 box should fit everybody in it. I think in some kinds, people are too early to assess. You really do not have enough information, and you should not 9 box them if you really don't know enough about them. Why? And I'll tell you this, because what box you put them in can cause people to think about them a certain way. And also, it pinpoints them and becomes this baseline. And if I was baselined um, as, let's say, strong performer but not high potential, I got to extra prove myself to get the potential column. When truth is, I had great potential, but I've only been working, say, four months at the company. It was too early to estimate my potential. You only know me for four months. But now I have to work for the next year or two or three to show you that I actually have more potential than when you boxed me my first four months. So hold off. Don't box people if you don't really know enough about them. What do I think is not enough? I honestly think um, it depends what level of position. If it's a more complexity, the more of a leadership position, give it one year at least. If it's a technical role, you'll know within six months if they have the technical skills or not, okay? Now, um, when you're looking at performance, don't just say your latest performance, your latest rating. Take a three-year average and consider what you've seen. If you have a forced distribution, don't use the ratings because they're false. They're forced distribution. Just talk about how well they've differentiated yourself. If they're a superior performer, you're saying that they're really pretty much, <laughs> if you're to have 10 peers, their performance is the top two of the 10. That's superior. If they're strong, you're saying they're the top four of the 10. If they're average, they're somewhere in the three, four, five of the 10. If they're below, it's probably the bottom one or two of the 10. All right? And so that's, so we have this category in the 11 box, performs below expectations. If they're really not performing well in their current job, don't worry about nine boxing them for greater things. Work on them in their perform, current performance. Take that performance failure chart that I showed you. Use that to help think about where is this person suffering? Is it a motivation issue? Is it a psychological issue? Is it something about not understanding the expectations? Are they not engaging their work? Do they not know what's expected of them? Is it something more along the lines of execution? Find out what's going on to not drive that performance. Now, also, I'm a believer in don't go too far down the road. None of us really know what 10 years from now is going to look like. I think AI is going to be a lot bigger in our organizations in 10 years. I think uh, the world communication systems is going to be more advanced. I think, you know, our way we work, I mean, there's going to be a lot of things. Our connectivity. But just say, in my opinion, look at seven-year time horizon. <coughs> they might be able to go up two levels within seven years, meaning pretty good promotion. I don't mean like they got a, a grade code increase in, in seven, you know, one or two grade code increases, because you can get a higher grade code, but you're still essentially doing the same job. But two levels. I'm a supervisor, then I move to manager, then I move to director. That's two levels. All right? And then have those conversations using Mark and Marco to help uh, get this. I talk about in the, in the, put their name, put their grade code, because that does matter in terms of what level they're at. Um, age, because you want to think how far they can go. If you're 53 years old, you don't have as much time to move up the ladder as if you're 33, right? And so it's a different spot. For the 53-year-old, is there, by the way, a mandatory retirement age in Nepal? that the government recognizes that people should step out of an organization, a company, and retire? What is it? 58. 5, 8? That's early. Oh, my goodness. They're going to be pulling on your Social Security system. And they're going to be taking retirement money and climbing Mount Everest at 58. I mean, wow. Okay, that's early. Saudi is 60. U.S. is 65, right, David? Yeah. 67 now. Oh, they've increased it. Wow, okay, airline pilots were like at 60 or 62, and then they moved them up to 64 or something like that. So um, there's time. 58, my goodness. Okay, maybe I should work in Nepal a little bit, you know? Um, all right, here we go. Uh, you know, as you looked at this, uh, we could talk about a little bit here, but, you know, think about uh, how you're identifying the potential of your employees. One challenge you might have is, how many people do you have to compare them to? If you only have a group of peers of five people, it's going to be hard to compare. But you still should differentiate them a little bit. Just be careful about nine boxing them. Um, so at the end, you might have questions. We don't have to do table time on this one. But uh, 
Let's move on to the next topic here. <coughs> it's assess readiness. Now, readiness is readiness for what? It's readiness to, for a certain new role at a higher level. And you're asking, how prepared are they to perform well at this level? How prepared are they to do the job and to do it well? So when you look at readiness for leadership roles, I want to talk about how you build leaders and the integrated approach. So what, what I'm saying is it's not just leadership development. That comes at the end. It's important to develop your leaders, absolutely. But it's also first important to assess them. Where are their competencies and skills? How much um, experience do they have? And does it show up that they have the experience, they perform it well? And I'll talk a little bit about what a good assessment looks like. And then as you get assessment data and you have experience with them on the job, do it, put them in succession planning, then know where the gaps are and what you're preparing them for, and move them over to leadership development. A simple three-step to uh, developing your leaders. <coughs> Let's talk about assessments. This is an assessment that I co-created with a friend called Sinclair Stevenson, who has worked with the Ramco on assessments for many years. And this has worked out very well for us. Um, we have what's called six leadership pillars, meaning these are foundational pillars that you should consider for any leadership role. And honestly, I think they're pretty universal. If you're to ask me the question, Steve, what is it that we should be thinking about when we think about our, our future leaders? What should we assess? What should we look at to prepare our future leaders? You should look at their experience. Absolutely. Absolutely look at their experience. Look at their style. How do they get along with people? Relationships factor into style. Look at desire. Um, any study will tell you that if you don't want to be a leader, you probably won't be a very good leader. <laughs> Occasionally, you have people who don't want to be a leader who get pulled into leadership and do all right. But when you desire to do something well, it engages your performance. When you have persistence, desire, drive, interest in something, you do better at it. You try harder. You work at it longer. Look for, know if your people really want to be a leader. And if they're, you think they can be a good leader, but they don't want to be a leader, have a conversation with them. Why? Are you afraid of being a leader? Do you not want to give feedback? Are you afraid of uh, the challenges of the role? Derailers. Hogan's looks at derailers. Understand that not all derailers are captured by Hogan's. I'll give you an example. If you find a leader in your organization who's lying regularly, not telling the truth to their people, not telling the truth to management, that's a derailer. Hogan's doesn't have a lying category, but people who can't tell the truth, there's a problem, okay? It really is. And one person brought that up this morning as an issue. Um, another derailer could be um, people who really have what I call competing commitments. And this is a reality in life, and listen carefully to this one. Our life is not all about our work, right? Let's be honest. We have a family, we have parents. We have interests, we have our faith, we have, you know, um, our, our hobbies. We have so many other things in our life that are important to us. And a derailer could be you have so many competing commitments that your commitment is not really most at your job. Because if you want to get better and grow, you're going to have to put some hard work into it. It might mean more hours at the job. It might mean more stress from the job. It might be your job takes more of your interest and time and resources than you want it to. But in return, you grow. The problem is, what suffered in the place of your job? What suffered? Do your kids know you well? Did you get to do what you really enjoy in life? Or has that been like years since you really did what you enjoy? Do you feel that your job is against your values? That you feel bad about who you are because of what you have to be like at work? If those are the situations, you don't have a good fit. And those can be derailers in the workplace because you have other commitments that are suffering. Now, long-term potential. That looks at capacity, capability, how far do you think that person can go. And then leadership competencies. Those are six good pillars. You're welcome to use them in your own assessments. You're welcome to talk about them. This is how we uh, do the day. We have some online assessments followed by... Um, some uh, a case, uh, a full day with a case study, simulations, actual people trying to do the work. The uh, competencies we measure are these eight. If it's an executive, instead of thinks creatively, which is down here is number eight, we then talk about think strategically, okay, as an executive. But these eight are pretty good fundamentals to leadership. Use them. It's fine. 
You might have another one or two, but here's what I'll caution you. When you use competencies and you really want to assess them by how they show up in a simulation in work-like situations, you want to measure at least three times the need to show that competency. Don't just have a one and done, like, oops, you missed showing that, so you don't have that competency. No. Give them at least three opportunities in the assessment simulations to show those competencies so you can see how it shows up and how often it shows up, even a fourth time, which also means don't have too many competencies. Don't try to measure 20 things. I would say seven to nine is a good number of competencies to measure in an assessment. Uh, the way we rate people are developed means that you really are not ready for the next level. You need to develop first. You're just not ready. Uh, we don't see that manager potential in you yet. There's a lot of experience you need. There's some skills you need to develop and all that. Adjustment means, um, you know what? You need to make some adjustments, but we think you could be capable at that level right now. You just need to make some adjustments. I wouldn't put them in the role right now, but I'd say with some improvements, with some learning, with some development, you can be ready for that. Suited means you're at that level. You, can, you, you have some development needs, sure, but you know what? You can go into that role and you'll probably be effective. Effective means you're going to be good early on. We think you're going to be perhaps even highly successful at that level right now. And then advanced means you're actually not just ready for the next level. You're ready for the level above that. Your comments are so strong that we think you can manage not the manager level, but the director level. That's, that's, that's what we use as effective. But again, maximum of a two-level jump. Measuring competencies is important because you want to make sure your leaders have the skills and capabilities to perform. These are the things that in the Marco model come out in achievements and capability. That's where the competencies show up. Again, uh, these are going to be in the slide deck you get, so you'll be able to use them if you want or have some questions about them. We can talk about these during the Q&A session. Now, this is what I use for a, a succession plan chart. Simple. Some boxes aligned to a role. Uh, the incumbent who's in the role now. Ready now means you believe the person is ready right now to move into that job today, and you would not worry about their <coughs> ability to do the job. That's ready now. I use the nomenclature ready one for ready now, or you can say RN for ready now. One to three means you think that the person needs some more development and experience to be ready for that job, to do it well. You think that there might be another job they need to do before that one, or at least some things they need to learn or practice or have more experience before they take the job. If you have to, you can move a ready one into the job immediately, but you expect them to have some struggles early on and need some coaching, some development, some feedback some support to do the job well. And then ready three means longer term, it might be three to five to maybe even seven years before you think this person is going to be ready for the role. A ready three means that you definitely need other experiences before you move in that role. A ready one to three means, oh, you know, just maybe you need to learn a few things and refine and, you know, adjust a few things. But a, but a ready three plus, or I call it a ready three, you have to get some other experiences. You should not go into the role right now at all under any circumstances. You need some experience. You need some learning. You need some development. You need to try it out. Whereas already now, the person can step into that role and act in the role for a month or so, no problems. Already one to three, maybe can also act, but that's the chart. Now, as you apply it, you have conversations about how have they demonstrated the ability to do the work. Already now should have I would think, in my opinion, already done that job a little bit by having an acting assignment while the person was out of the office, working closely with the person for many years, providing a lot of information that feeds into the decisions for their roles, and having the exposure to make what? Good decisions. Remember, good decisions really matter as a leader. One of the challenges with succession planning is thinking people can do everything. And here you have a, a similar roles or region. Let's say you have the Western region, the international, and, the, and then the Kathmandu region on, a, on the same kind of job. You can group them together and make <coughs> more of a talent pool where you look at successors that can go into any one of those jobs. A talent pool is saying, you know, we're going to pull together these people and you can choose, you know, to fit into any one of those roles. It's just a broader way of looking at it. But what you have to be careful of is do not have 
Um, so many differences in the roles, you think everybody can do everything. That's a fallacy. Because, again, we're measuring readiness, not potential. So readiness is not challenging their capacity to do something well in the future. It's measuring their ability to do it now, their competence to do it now, okay? Their experience that tells them how to do it, their ability to make good decisions, to work at that level. So somebody might be in ready three, and they could be 10 years younger than the current person in that role, maybe even 15 years. You're saying long-term, this is the direction this young person can go in and a potential role they might take. And a ready one to three, be, for, be sure to define, if they're ready one to three, what is it that's missing? What is it that we want to see? What is it they need to grow? What is it they need to improve upon to get in that role? Have a reason why they're ready one to three and not ready now. Force your leaders to give you that answer. What is it about, you know, this person that you don't think makes them ready now for the role? What is it you like to see happen to them in the next two years to better prepare them for the role? Is there a behavior change you're looking for? Is it a different style? Is it some experience? Is it something they have to prove? But have that definition. Make leaders think about it. Don't just have their favorite people all of a sudden be ready now and the less favorite people be ready one to three. That can happen, right? People have their favorite people. So anyone says you're ready now, say, why? How have they proven themselves that they're truly ready for this role right now in their career? That you would not have a concern putting them in the role tomorrow. <coughs> we talked about positions and we talked about experience and we talked about giving people the opportunities. This research from Corn Ferry I thought was fascinating. They took five leadership levels five levels of leaders, and they surveyed their career and said, how many of you have had these different experiences in the course of your career? Now, what you find is there's a direct correlation between level in their organization and the amount of people that had those experiences. What just reading here is if you are a, a first level leader, only about 28% of the first level leaders have actually had the experience of critical negotiations. And maybe about 29% have actually inherited problems and challenges from other people. Um, and, and only about, uh, you know, 30, let's say it's probably about 30% have actually done a startup business. But if you go to a CEO, they've had more time in their career, so there's a factor here I want to share with you. You know, more time in your career, you have more opportunities for these experiences, all right? So I want to I want to caution that. But the idea is that as you move up in the organization, you need multiple experiences to prepare you to be a, a leader at that level. And people who become chief executive officers have had a lot of experiences in a variety of different jobs and a variety of challenges to prepare them to be a chief executive officer. And that makes them more effective. I can tell you that um, this is public knowledge. I'll share with you. One of the Kraft Foods, we had a CEO called, called Betsy Holden. Betsy was an amazing individual, highly talented female leader. She was a school teacher for a while, then got out of being a school teacher and went to get an MBA in her late 20s, early 30s, got the MBA from Northwestern, came into Kraft. Throughout her 30s, she was a remarkable marketing person, went up the organization quickly. In her 40s, she became a senior leader, working up the organization quickly. In her mid-40s, okay, late 40s perhaps, I think late 40s, she became the CEO of Kraft Foods. Yet, she only had about 18 years in the business, 19 years in the business. And I have to look at the numbers, so I don't want to quote me on that one. But it's basically, she hadn't had enough challenging experiences to teach enough about the company. After a while in that role, they had a co-CEO came up. The co-CEO had a lot of operations experience. Why? Because Betsy did not have a, any manufacturing experience or operations experience. She had marketing and some sales experience and other things, but she didn't see the whole company. She didn't have the whole picture. And so what's going on here is that she didn't have enough preparation for a global 100 company as CEO. And people need those experiences. She was a remarkable, capable, highly potential person. 
but did she have the right experiences? And do you have the right experiences in your organization for your leaders? You don't have to raise your hand on this one, okay? But I want you to reflect on this question. If your CEO, when you go back to the office next week, says, I've resigned, could be for any reason, going somewhere else, retiring early, done. Your CEO is walking out within, let's say, a month or two. Do you, HR leader, know who would be your next CEO? Are you now, are you confident in that person to step into the CEO role? Now you're getting scary, right? Some of you are like, I don't know if I'm that confident. So how ready is your successor for CEO? Do you only have one? Is there only one person that comes to mind who could step in and be CEO in two months? Are there two? Does each person have the experience necessary? to be in that role. Because guess what? Two months won't be enough time to get all the experiences. Start preparing people now. And I start at the CEO level. Because if your company doesn't have a next CEO, your company's at risk. And you as HR, this should be your responsibility. Your responsibility to say, hey, Part of my job, and perhaps one of the most important parts of my job, is to prepare for the next CEO. Help figure out who those people are, get them ready, and then have some choices. Not just one person, but have some choices for that role. How about your next vice president? In my life, um, last year, I, I joined the board of directors for American Mission Hospital in Bahrain. They brought me on the board because... They have a lot of organizational growth challenges and organizational leadership challenges. And the CEO, who's been there for 15 years, highly successful, we need to prepare for the next levels of leaders. So one of the first things I did as a board member is I got close to HR and I implemented some processes. I actually said, hey, look, guys, this is what we got to do. And I went after number one, number one, succession planning. Number two, leadership assessments. And I joined the board in June of last year. And today we have a succession planning policy in the company and we have leadership assessments ready to go to assess the executive team followed by the management team. We have it ready right now to go. It was ready by January, so it took me six months to get that ready in the company because that was critical to the survival of the hospital. So how are you in your company preparing for the succession plan, finding that next leader, and then developing the next leader? Here's some development experiences. These are very popular experiences people can have. These are important experiences. You don't have to have every one of these experiences, but I'll tell you, most people who lead at the executive level have had all these experiences and have learned from those experiences. So I have in the blue the different, some of the different things you can learn from these kind of experiences. Sometimes people in their work will start getting these experiences through the business cycle as things come up. But you as HR need to think about it. The people who I think a few minutes ago, the people you thought made one or two, hopefully you had in mind saying these people could be the CEO, how many of them have had these different experiences to prepare them? Have they started up a new division in your organization, a new business line? A new product line, that's a startup. It doesn't have to be a small company. Fix it turnarounds. Have you put them into a situation that says, man, this group has struggled, the numbers are bad, can you turn it around? Can you fix it? Have they had to do large-scale projects? There's other type of work, but I just listed a few here. And this is to the research done by uh, The Lessons from Experience, a great book that came out around, believe it or not, 1988, but it's a solid book. You see, what we're asking is you go from being an individual contributor to an executive only by changing, by growing. 
early in your career, it's more about short-term thinking, doing what's put in front of you. You don't have to worry about as many stakeholders because you worry about your boss. You manage tasks you're given. You make sure you're able to execute and get the job done. And it's a lot of transactional. That's early in your career. That's great. We start by learning how to get work out, get it done, learning what's necessary. Then we start working with others. But by the time you get to be a senior executive or a chief executive, you have to be a different person. Very much so. You have to now develop the ability to see long term, to think about not, did I get the job done, but where are we going with this company? How is AI changing the marketplace and how will that impact our business? Who are the competitors that we don't have today but might come into our business? What are the things that our company is doing that we need to build on and do better and do more of and do it, and do it more effectively? What do we need to become, not just how good are we today, but what do we need to become? Another area is stakeholders. Executives have shareholders to worry about. They have employees to worry about. They have um, peers to worry about. They have the government to worry about. A lot of stakeholders. Portfolio, managing a large portfolio, maximizing value, being transformational. These are the things that help leaders at the top level um, execute their job. But I'll tell you this, it doesn't happen by just sitting around the job for 20 years. You learn these things by experience. So if you go back to our previous slide, if you don't give them these experiences, they won't change much. Look for opportunities for your people to grow. Sometimes those opportunities don't just happen within your company. You can take an aspiring leader and say, find a nonprofit organization that's struggling and go and help it su survive. I did that with Red Cross 15 years ago. I was put on the board of directors for a Red Cross chapter, became the chapter chair, transformed it. It was suffering, guys. Let me tell you, it was challenging. But it really grew me. And I was just in my late 30s when I did that. Now, in succession plan, as you develop all these people, Take a look at the pipeline. How many young people do you have identified on the plan? Look at that number. How many people, what are their ages? How many are unique successors versus total successors? Here's the difference. A total successors means how many people are ready for the next level of responsibility. And you might have Jonathan Lowe here, my friend who will be a speaker tomorrow. He's ready to do three different jobs in the company. That's great. He is capable, in our estimation, to step into three different executive roles in our company. But guess what? There's only one Jonathan. We can't have him do all three jobs. So although he's capable of three different jobs and he can cover us if this person leaves or if this person leaves or if this person leaves, and we feel comfortable he can do that job, the problem is he can't do all of them at one time. So he's only one unique successor. So you might have people who you see is capable of many jobs, but you only have a small pool of people. You don't want that to happen to you because then you're relying on a small group of people. And what if they leave? So you want to develop a good number of different unique successors. Um, so we have 134 different you know, people who can be successors in jobs, but only 56 are unique, which unique successor R1s were in 0.96, meaning that a little less than one person for a job. It's not the best plan because we're saying, oh boy, we don't have as many successors for certain jobs, so we need to get some more ready now successors. Okay. So look at that pipeline. Again, think about the question. If your CEO left, who's ready now? But what you really need to think about is if your vice president left, if your director left, who's ready? If your manager left, who's ready? Go down the organization. Start at the top, but keep working down the organization because you as HR are responsible for the people in the organization. And you need to make sure your people are ready to do bigger jobs. Take some time at your table. Pick just one or two of these questions to talk about at your table for a little while. Pick one or two. If you have time, go to the third question. You don't have to do all four. But pick some questions to talk now at your table about as you think about leadership readiness.
Okay, in lieu of time, just one more minute, okay? So one more minute to share something, try to get into thought. I would take this, uh, these questions back to your HR team, back in your organization, talk about them with your team. These are some good questions to think about your talent. to have a two-way feedback session so that we could improve our individual growth as well as the business growth. Thank you. I love this question because in the culture, in the Asian culture, but uh, also in the Saudi culture, um, there is the saving face factor. And two-way feedback is very difficult. It's difficult for someone to tell their manager something negative. For, trust me, I experienced this myself. I've been 10 years in Saudi. I've made mistakes on this one because I'm an American, and in America, we have more open, direct, two-way communication, and you can't do that so well in, in, in Saudi Arabia, with some senior leaders especially. Um, but, but I'll tell you um, something that's important. One way you can work around this that was very successful, we did this at Microsoft a lot, and it's remarkably powerful, and I coached this one new leader to do it. He loved it, and that's to have a skip-level meeting maybe once a year, maybe twice a year. What is a skip-level meeting? So I report to you this gentleman right here, and we work regularly and all that. But this gentleman reports to this gentleman sitting over here. I normally should be talking to my manager, okay, and have regular communication and conversation. I might not want to tell the manager some tough feedback on him or her because guess what? Um, you know, that person might get mad at me and I might be impacted. So it's very difficult to do that. Now, you can do 360s. That's a method. You can do other things. But that can be challenging. But a skip level means is that maybe twice a year I get to talk to the, his boss. Now, this can be very disconcerting for this leader. Because now I'm talking to his boss just twice a year. I'm not talking I informally give him a call. You should be careful of that. I'm talking it's scheduled, it's expected, it's known. And he might ask me, not necessarily about how's your boss doing. He might just ask me how's work going along, what's your team environment like, what do you think about the initiatives we're doing, but also learn about how well I'm working under this boss and learn a little bit about my boss. It's going to give him some powerful information about the work team, but it gives me a chance to also vent frustrations and issues I might be having. Now, I shouldn't save all my, if I have negative feedback, I try to get the message across to my boss. But if I can't, this is one option. It's a challenging option, but if it's done well, it's super powerful. Because now the employees also feel like if I'm under a bad leader, at least I get to tell somebody. I've seen, I'm just straight with you. So many HR organizations in the Middle East that I've seen are not strong enough for employees to go to and talk about issues with their boss. You know why? People talk within HR and they share and word gets out. They don't trust HR enough to keep it confidential. So employees don't have an outlet to say, I really, I'm not getting through to my boss. I, we have challenges. I need to talk to someone. HR is not a good person to talk to. Who can I talk to? So try to schedule in some skip level meetings. That would be one powerful tool. Just work it in the organization at the right level. This second level boss needs to respect that. Um, it needs to be a balanced conversation, but it needs to be open. Okay, any final question? Then I think we'll probably step, uh, step away. But I'll be around till tomorrow around 1 o'clock if anyone else wants to talk. But any other yeah. final question? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Dilip. So basically, my question is with the HR also. Uh, what are the best three ways to have a conducive environment in an organization that, that will help everyone as a whole? Okay, how do you build a good HR environment, are you asking? They will have, if there is a conducive environment, HR will have a paradise, definitely. A conducive or? Environment in an organization. Uh -huh. That is really good to be a place to work in. Okay, thank you, okay, yeah. Um, you know, what makes a difference there? I, I can tell you that uh, some of the best research on that is old, but it's so good. It was from Gallup Organization in the 1990s, and there's a book that was written about it that came out in 99 called First Break All the Rules. And uh, in that book, First Break All the Rules, they talk about, under their regression analysis, what were the 13 questions that most predicted team productivity? And that's what they're measuring, highly productive workplace. Not necessarily a highly happy workplace, but a highly productive one. But here's the reality. I rarely find a workplace that's healthy without being very productive. And so look at those variables. It's about friendships. It's about communication. It's about having resources for your work, knowing what's expected of you having feedback, and, and all those kind of variables that are not surprising, 
but have as many of those elements as possible. But to simplify it, just look at that book, and I can share a handout, actually, summarizing a lot about that, Maybe and they, they can be sent out, um, just a two-page or handout. But it's really powerful in terms of what predicts highly productive, which I think has a strong impact on also um, a, a good, effective workplace, one that people are happy with. Okay. I so much enjoyed this morning. Thank you so much, and uh, I'll be around. Thank you so much, Mr. Stephen McIntosh. I request you to please be on the center stage as the team of Growth Seller would like to honor you with a token of appreciation. May I invite uh, Mr. Mohan sir and Ms. Samjana Ma'am to please be here to give away the token of appreciation. I believe everyone uh, enjoyed the session. One more time, a big round of applause for Mr. Stephen, please. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, ma'am, for helping us do the honors. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to move forward with the second session of the event. But before that, let me take a moment to thank our sponsors again. Uh, you're here attending the HR Meet 2024, organized by Growth Seller Private Limited, Knowledge Partner, Growth Leadership Academy Private Limited, event managed by, managed by a growth Corporate Club Nepal Private Limited, collaboration with Project Management Association of Nepal. Diamond sponsors, we have Arkbu uh, Technology, Better Homes, Gold Sponsor, Nubble Bank Private Limited, IME Pay, Nimble Invoices, F1 Soft International, Nepal SBI Bank Limited, Model Institute of Technology, SMS Partner, Sparrow SMS. Before we head to the second session, uh, for any organization, the CEO's vision definitely sets the direction and overarching goals of the company, while HR strategy plays a pivotal role in aligning human capital initiatives with these objectives. I am sure you're well aware about the second session, which is Striking the balance, CEO's vision versus HR strategy in organizational success. This session has been planned aiming to explain the importance of striking a balance between the two in achieving sustainable organizational success by presenting contrast perspective and real world examples. And to moderate this very session, I would like to call upon someone who has been working in human resources sector with different organizations for more than two and a half decade. She was associated with the Golcha Group for 15 years before retiring a few months ago. She feels that the impact she has made on the HR functions in the organization is immense. And she's brought a lot of changes that she will be sharing here today as well. Uh, herself, uh, she has also initiated different innovative ways of employee engagement and implemented in the organizational successes as well. With a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome senior HR professional, Ms. Neeta Rana on stage. Neetha ma'am, I request you to take the floor forward by introducing our other speakers. Can we have the mic, please? <laughs> 